The president reacts to newly published documents that falsely accuse former Trump associate Carter Page of being a Russian agent. Meanwhile, the Democrats accuse President Trump of being a Russian agent. Yes, the world has gone mad, but it's okay. We're here to make sense of it for you. Evening, everyone, and welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton, and this is the home of positive populism. With us, live in Los Angeles, Richard Fowler and Lisa Booth. A big story for you tonight on the Democrats and immigration and a swamp watch on how the loyal workforce at Toys R Us has been treated by elitist fat cats that you won't want to miss. But first, last week, we was the divisive 2020 presidential wannabe Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton. Do you think it's possible that the president is a Russian asset with or without his knowledge? Well, I'm just saying that I don't know. As usual, the extremism of the left pushes people not away from President Trump, but towards him. Look, after all the unhinged Russia talk this week, there are two important things to remember. First, that Putin is not the only, nor is he the most dangerous communist dictator threatening America. China's Xi Jinping is much more authoritarian, much more evil, and a much bigger threat. China's been meddling in our democracy for years, and you've barely heard a peep out of the elites in Washington, mainly because they've been corrupted by Chinese cash, as we will show you in a can't-miss swamp watch next Sunday. The second important thing to remember is that we are the ones who've made our democratic process vulnerable to foreign attack by buying into the idea that technology improves it. Here's another IYI in action this week. Rod Rosenstein talking about how the Justice Department is planning to protect the 2018 midterm elections. Public attribution of foreign influence campaigns can help to counter and mitigate the harm caused by foreign-sponsored misinformation. When people are aware of the true sponsor, they can make better informed decisions. We also help technology companies to counter covert foreign influence efforts. The FBI works with partners in the intelligence community to identify foreign agents as they establish their digital infrastructure and as they develop their online presence. What an idiot. Dear Deputy Attorney General, the more we rely on big centralized technology, the more fragile and vulnerable we are. If you want to make our elections secure, go back to people marking their ballots with a pencil and paper, human beings counting them in school halls and phoning in the results on a landline. I'd like to see Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping try to hack millions of pencils across America. But no, our intellectual yet idiot ruling class has been bribed and mesmerized by big business and big tech. What a bunch of idiots. Tell me what you think at NextRevFNC and at Steve Hilton X. And make sure you pre-order my new book, Positive Populism. Here's the website. You can get it, positivepopulism.org. Right, here to discuss all of that, Fox News contributor and syndicated radio host Richard Fowler and Fox News contributor and senior fellow at Independent Women's Voice, Lisa Booth. What a team. Here we go. And congrats on the new book, Steve. Thank you so much. Well, you haven't I'm read it yet. To, no, but I'm still <laughs> I've already pre-ordered. It's so exciting. <laughs> it's I'm sure it'll be Give great. Give me the so. congrats after you've read it. Um, look, the, the, the president this week, you know, he took a lot of heat, including from, from many voices on this network, yours included. Right. I, I watched your, your reaction um, to what happened on on Monday. Um, but th what's interesting to me is that, you know, you have Brian Kilmeade, Laura Ingram and others. But what's interesting is that it seems to me the more over the top the, the critics go, the more it actually sways people in favor of President Trump and his supporters just feel more in support of him. Well, absolutely. And, and look, you wonder why President Trump, too, uh, questioned the Intelligence Committee under President Obama. And then you hear John Brennan uh, speaking like that. So, of course, President Trump had concerns about the intel community under President Obama. But you're right, Steve. A lot of us were, you know, concerned, didn't like the press conference. He even lost Newt Gingrich, has been, you know, probably right. one of the most reliable people in his corner. But here you go, and you've got all these people that grossly overreach. And you're right, it does bring people into his camp. Comparing it to Pearl Harbor, where we lost 2,400 Americans, you know, over 1,400 people injured, led to the Second World War. Yeah. We're talking about 60 million plus people died, 3% of the world's population. So to make a comparison like that is completely idiotic. And this is what people. That's another one. They're not, was it the same person that um, compared it to Kristallnacht? 
under the Nazis. Well, I mean, just unbelievable, this kind of talk. Well, and people also continue to forget that President Trump, in terms of his policies, has been way tougher than President Obama was. And it was Robert Gates and Leon Panetta that said that Putin saw the opportunity to meddle in the election because of President Obama's weakness and his failure to match rhetoric with actions. So, Richard, come on then. Do you think President Trump is a Russian agent? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I can't speak to That's that. That's what right? Seth Bolton said. Oh, come off it. You can't uh, even. But and here's you can't what, think it's even. But here's no, the, but I think the reason. You have someone in Congress who's literally going to be one of the candidates for president. I doubt Seth Bolton's going to run not, for Congress. He's not dismissing president. this to but completely out of lies, hand. But here lies the larger problem. The reason why we could even have this discussion is because President Trump opened the floodgates. The first thing the president does from a messaging perspective is he tries to, you know, conflate Russia meddling to Trump campaign collusion. There is a big a wide chasm between those two things. The Russia, Russia meddling in our election yeah. is a fact, yes, period. absolutely. The Trump campaign colluding is under investigation by the Mueller investigation, so we have to wait to see what happens with that. And I think what, when he keeps conflating the two, that is why he's in the situation that he's in today, but and he's had one of the really worst two that, weeks in foreign was, policy. Yeah. But do you really think that it's been President Trump conflating those two issues? Yes. Democrats have been leading the charge in conflating the two issues to try to delegitimize this president. And Steve, one thing that never gets talked about, you had those on the left that were calling for faithless electors. So if we're worried about sowing chaos in the electoral process, yeah. nobody called that out. What does that do? What sort of message does that send voters that essentially your vote is irrelevant and you had those on the left encouraging that? So on the chaos point, there's another, th I've, I've heard this theory, I'd love to get your reaction to it, which is that, let's just say, let's just say that I mean, there's a lot of uh, talk that the Russians are absolutely doing it just as much as they before are. for the midterms, <laughs> right. So, there, but there's speculation that actually if they really want to do the chaos, then what is chaotic is split government, divided government, you have Democrats controlling Congress, pre uh, Republican in the White House, the Democrats might then impeach Trump. They want that chaos. In other words, that this time the Russian interference could be in favor of Democrats. If that turns out to be true, do you think the Democrats might actually have a different story on it. No, I, listen, I don't, I, there's no story on it. Our, our democracy is at stake when Russia or any foreign entity engage our election. And divided government, whether you like it or not, is actually the most effective government. Ask Newt Gingrich. He got more done as Speaker of the House working with Bill Clinton. Ask Tip O'Neill. He got more done working with Ronald Reagan. Democrats and Republicans working together mm -hmm. actually get more things That's accomplished. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. History proves that. Okay. But, but the problem is that Democrats have been running this with this narrative of, you know, basically leaving open the idea that Russia actually influenced the election. But One, they did. The Obama administration... <laughs> no, sorry, but, just but be the clear, they tried to, everyone agrees that they tried to. No, there's they, absolutely no agreement no, we, that it affected the we result. We were told well, we by don't. Jay Johnson that, one, the system is too decentralized to be, to you know, for Russia to actually have an impact on the votes, you know, being counted themselves. President Obama's come out and said that no votes were changed. You look at the amount of money spent, look at places on social media, $2,000 in Wisconsin is a joke. Jeb Bush spent, I think, almost so $3,000 Let's per very, voter in the Republican primary in Beyond the state the fact, of Iowa, two thousand dollars is nothing. Beyond it's the fact not changing that the votes Russians or tried to hack into voting machines all across the country. They also, by the way, we could have easily been the Chinese and the Iranians and the Koreans I mean, as they, well. They, we're constantly going on about Russia. As I, 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 I hear saying, all that, but, 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 but the debate, the debate is around. Why don't you go on about the debate? The debate, the debate right now is around Russia, Russia meddling in our election. And here's what we know for the here's what we know to be fact. They hacked in they tried to hack into yeah. various voter machines, voter and voter voter systems. We know they hacked the DNC. We know they hacked Podesta. That had a definite impact on the DNC operation. Period. And if they had an effect on a DNC operation, which is a major political party in this country, they impacted the election. So this notion or this ideal but that Russia never very, impacted the election wait, is ridiculous. But impacted is a very kind of vague term. Impacted does not is not the same as influenced and cause the election but you're, one so way you're, or another. So here's, so here's the question then. So the question, the, the, the real question on the table is, is the fact that all those DNC emails were out there, do you think that had no impact on voters? You think one voter didn't change their mind because they read all those emails? Well, if I, one I, voter I, changed their mind, the then idea, the Russia idea that, had an impact on this election. The idea that, that uh, you know, after this incredibly huge and surprising upset, beat this, this most unlikely I'm not candidate Trump didn't win beating 16 outright. Republicans than the most qualified la -di -da candidate ever. Well, and, the, and, the, and the idea that that incredible turnaround to what everyone expected happened because of the Russians, to me, seems No, that's not... Like, I think ridiculous. you're misconstruing what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if the, or email, else, if the, the email hack of yeah. Podesta's emails and the DNC emails slowed down one political party's ability to compete against another political party, then no, they had an okay. influence on the right. election. You've made that point before, at least the last one. Well, one... 
the WikiLeaks and the information released hardly got any coverage, especially hardly got any coverage. Not in comparison. I think the allegations against President Trump were covered seven times as much as WikiLeaks in one week period. So it barely got covered in terms of some of these unsubstantiated allegations. You're not allowed to respond. Don't prepare your next thing. This is has the last. Also, I like this. Also, another point is the fact that President Trump has responded to this meddling as well in terms of sanctions, in terms of expelling Russian diplomats, and in terms of shuttling, shuttering uh, consulates and things like that. Obama in terms, okay. And also in response, sending lethal <laughs> weapons <laughs> to Ukraine. I mean, President Trump has responded by being very tough on Russia. Okay, there we are. Good debate. Um, my, I'm going to say it again. If you want an election that is not going to be hacked by anyone, pencil and paper. I agree there. That's paper the way ballots. to go. All right, coming up, retail giant Toys R Us is out of business, and over 30,000 employees are fighting to get what they say they deserve. Swap Watch exposes the elite's disgraceful treatment of Toys R Us workers. And there used to be a time when Democrats were the party of working Americans, but some shocking news this week shows you that's no longer true. We'll tell you what it is after the break. Welcome back, everyone. In 2015, Bernie Sanders said... Open borders, it would make everybody in America poorer. You're doing away with the concept of a nation state. Bring in all kinds of people, work for $2 or $3 an hour. I don't believe in that. I think we have to raise wages in this country. I think we have to do everything we can to create millions of jobs. You know what youth unemployment is in the United States of America today? You think we should open the borders and bring in a lot of low-wage workers? Or do you think maybe we should try to get jobs for those kids? His political group, our revolution has just fired our friend Teslin Figaro for saying basically the same thing. Teslin joins me now. Teslin, so great to see you. Thanks, thanks for, for, for being with us tonight. We, as, you, as I Thank just you. said, good friend of the show. We don't always agree, but we always love the conversation. Um, just tell us what happened this week. Well, you know, it's really unfortunate. Some comments that I'd made um, prior to joining our revolution was dug up, um, was saying that, you know, um, me being a former staffer, uh, working for the largest staffing firms in the world, first and third largest staffing firm, I put over 300 people to work on my own, on my own payroll. So I was expressing a view on what people have experienced, particularly the African-American community, on what they've experienced as far as not being have access to jobs, not going on what I heard, Steve, but going on what I know. Um, so because I made that comment, uh, there were a few people within the organization organization that did not agree and felt that it did not play into today's talking point, political talking point. And instead of talking about the issue at hand, which is the same thing that you are absolutely correct, that Senator Sanders said, that we have to do something um, about immigration, not being against immigrants, certainly not being against um, people who are in this country now who are suffering with the separation of their children, but mm -hmm. certainly also saying that it is important that we also talk about the people of this country, the people who are suffering now. You know, Congressman Barbara Jordan said the same thing, who's from Houston, Texas, where I'm at now, even Senator Barack Obama said the same thing before he became president. So it seems that Democrats um, have lost their way um, with not being able to balance both conversations to talk about Americans, particularly the African-American community, which is why Tom Perez is now apologizing to black women. So they're full of apologies, but yet have done nothing to actually work on the policies and the principles that matter to people like myself. And Tessa, it's so interesting to me that the shift, you know, from as we've just agreed to what, what the um, Bernie Sanders was saying in 2015, even during the course of the 2016 campaign, you could feel that he was pulling back from some of that argument as he realized that in the Democratic Party today, you can't get anywhere unless you really sign up to this open borders ideology, which is basically blesses any kind of immigration without limit. What do you think lies behind that shift in the party? How do, you're, in, you're inside of it. You're in these conversations. What's driving this? Well, I mean, I would just say, just like hip-hop says, it's all about money, power, and respect. And the squeaky oil always gets the wheel. Um, unfortunately, even though African Americans certainly agree with what I said, um, the message hasn't been brought out to them, because to be quite honest with you, the left-wing media just doesn't want to cover it. You know, I'm criticized for coming on Fox News, even though I'm standing up for African Americans, called a racist, even though that's impossible to mm -hmm. be a racist, to be black. Um, but the, the reality is, it's all about who is going to scream the loudest. And African Americans have been screaming for a very long time. We've been screaming. We 
we've been shouting, we've been marching. So um, the group has become disenfranchised and really just kind of over it. They don't no longer believe in politics, politicians or politics. So th that group of folks haven't haven't got the same respect. And because we pride ourselves on voting over 90 percent, 95 percent Democrat Party, it is of less of value. That is mm -hmm. why Tom Perez apologized to black women. But I'm here to tell black people, black women to vote independent, be independent, make them actually come for our vote. The days are over for just being the mistress. And so until we demand that type of respect and say that I am OK mm -hmm. with it means if I lose a contract, I'm fine with that, because what I call this is the consequences of consciousness. And I've had elders who have gone before me who have endured much worse. Tessin, thanks so much for that. Just stay with us. I'm just going to get Richard and Lisa, their reaction on this. This issue of, of the, the tension between uncontrolled immigration and its impact on workers, jobs, and incomes, it, it, it just seems like that argument has gone all one way in the Democratic Party today. Well, I, I don't think you can characterize the De Democratic Party as one thing or another, because I think Tessin says, makes a good point, right, that, you know, we need to be working on rebuilding communities like Baltimore, rebuilding communities like Detroit, rebuilding communities like Chicago. And what those communities need more than ever is they need investments and they need politicians and leaders that get it. But that all, with that being said, they can also benefit from not building a wall on our southern border because that money can go to being invested in Chicago. One, real quick, uh, we've seen historic lows for African-American unemployment and Hispanic unemployment under this president. I would also say you can label the Democrat Party as one thing, and I would label them as intolerant as evidenced by Teslin being fired because she had a differing point of view. Uh, basically, the left operates in a mob mentality. If you don't share that belief, then they try to shut you down. They fire you, um, a case in point there. But back to your point regarding immigration, it is Democrats have done a complete 180 on this topic because, as Teslin pointed out, President Obama in his book, Audacity of Hope, essentially made that same argument that, uh, you know, influx, excessive influx of illegal immigration and immigration hurts low skilled workers. President Obama literally wrote that. And it was back in the day, not even back to 2006, where Senator Dianne Feinstein yeah. was saying things like Democrats are solidly behind defending our borders and border security, and now it's the complete opposite. And, and it's funny, I mean, that Obama point is so true. I've said that to Democrat friends of mine, and they and they said, oh, yeah, of course, Obama, he's a restrictionist. You know, he's, well, he's, I, I just and so we got no time. Just, last word to Tez, and I'd just like, like to see see if you've got any, any thoughts based on what Richard and Lisa have said, or just uh, wrap it up for us, Teslin. Well, you know, I, I agree with a lot with both the panelists said. I mean, where we talk about the financial point about, you know, it's not important to spend, to spend the money on building the wall, but also spend in the African-American community. Before President Trump ever talked about building the wall, the money wasn't spent in the African-American community. Um, we certainly know there's those of us who have been working on the left side. You know, I'm speaking again from being an employer myself, signing the front of the check, putting second chance citizens back to work. You know, I'm really sick and tired of one thing, sweeping this constant hypocrisy under the rug. I'm not saying that Republicans get a pass because there's work to do there, too. But it's the Democrat Party that comes around to the churches. It's the Democrat Party that asks for our votes. It's the Democrat Party that we've been loyal to. And so those are the ones that we have mm -hmm. to hold accountable. And this has been way before Trump has, has gotten in office. And it's just time that we actually stand up and speak up for ourselves and demand that they that they have our vote. And I want to say one last thing. I have never been against mm -hmm. anybody. I'm a veteran, a U.S. veteran of this country. And I'm offended when someone says I'm against anybody. I was willing to die for everybody. But I have a problem when we still have children who are sleeping on cement floors here in Houston, Texas, for her. Hurricane Harvey, but yet we're also concerned about migrant children sleeping on cement floors too. So if we're concerned about children on cement floors, let's get them all off the floor and let's start by building each other up, Amen. Americans yeah. as well as migrant uh, communities. The very powerful, Tess, and really appreciate that, sincerely. And thank, um, you. thank you for being with us and, and all the best and hope to see you back here in Los Angeles soon. Thanks a lot. Coming up, the unacceptable face of Silicon Valley. Can you guess whose it is? find out after the break. But now, we'll be taping a special episode of The Next Revolution in New York on Wednesday, August the 1st, with world-renowned psychologist and author Jordan Peterson. We'd love to have you in the audience. For tickets, email us at hiltonaudience at foxnews.com. Welcome back, everyone. While the world cheered the heroic rescue of 12 Thai boys and their coach last week from a flooded cave, tech billionaire Elon Musk found himself getting into hot water. Here's what happened. And it's not exactly what's been reported elsewhere. After the cave crisis had been going on for over a week, someone asked Elon Musk on Twitter whether he or his engineers might be able to help. 
That led to a frenzied burst of work between the rescue team and Elon Musk's team, in which, to be fair, Musk behaved with complete professionalism and integrity. Later, a cave diver who was involved criticized Elon Musk, unfairly in my view, for trying to exploit the situation for PR benefit. In response, Musk did what any normal person would do, used his massive Twitter platform to accuse him of being a pedophile, which as far as I'm concerned is literally the worst thing you can say about someone, tweeting, sorry pedo guy, you really did ask for it. Was this vile accusation just a rush of blood to the head? No, after the inevitable outrage, Musk didn't back down, he doubled down, again tweeting, bet you a signed dollar it's true. Eventually, after his own shareholders told him to, Musk issued a mealy-mouthed apology, which still included an attack on the man he'd so baselessly and viciously insulted, and his actions against Musk. Actions against you? What are you talking about? This is just a regular caving guy. You're a billionaire, one of the most famous people in the world with a string of celebrity wives and girlfriends and 20 million Twitter followers. I hope lawmakers remember all this as they shower Elon Musk in taxpayer subsidies, reportedly nearly $5 billion worth. $5 billion. His Tesla cars come with a federal government subsidy of $7,500, topped up still further by taxpayers in certain states, including Arizona, Colorado, Louisiana, and of course, California. I hope you're happy that your tax dollars are at work to help some of the richest people in the country show off their environmental virtue and to help one of the richest people in the world who has shown us what a sick bully he can be. I used to admire Elon Musk. I met him once around six years ago, and he showed me and a friend around his rocket factory right here in Los Angeles. I thought he was an inspiring entrepreneur. Now look what he's become. His descent into arrogance and bullying of the weak is a massive warning to the rest of Silicon Valley. Lisa, what do you make of this story? Well, ironically, I, I think the biggest sin that Elon Musk did in terms of Silicon Valley is this report that he donated $40,000 to this Republican oh super PAC. God. I mean, in all honesty, I think that's going to really have the Silicon Valley people much angrier right. with him than this. But uh, obviously, going to the calling someone a pedophile is just a disgusting and slanderous thing to do. Obviously, this guy, the caver, is looking to potentially sue Elon Musk, so he's opening himself up from a legal standpoint to that challenge. And he's also got to be careful here because there's been numerous reports that his investors are really unhappy with him. Some of these Twitter antics they're upset with. Mm -hmm. Also, there's been reports of the new Model 3 car that cancellations are ex exceeding new orders. So they're upset about that as well. So, you know, he does need to be careful here. And as you pointed out, he apologized once his investors went to him and were like, you've got to fix this situation. Yeah. So, Richard, I don't know. There's something about this sort of powerful person using their platform to bully someone I just found really offensive. I agree there. And I think, though, I mean, let's first say that these cape divers were absolute heroes. And I yes, mean, to great. do what Thank they you. did um, and to save all that entire team and their coaches, amazing. But beyond that, I think what Elon Musk is a poster child for is corporations gone bad. There was a time in this country where corporations actually had a vested interest in improving America. They invested in community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They believed in, you know, building community and building America and raising wages and they believed that, you know, we got to stand by our workers. Now I think you see the opposite. And Elon Musk is the poster child for that. Now corporations are in this ridiculous race to the bottom where they continue to pile on more cash in the bank and their workers get hurt and they engage in these Twitter battles and get nowhere while the American people suffer. And this is a, he's just an example right. of where corporations country have gone to. There you are. What a brilliant curtain raiser for Swamp Watch. I, I, think, I think it was so intentional. Yeah, he's so good. Richard was like, I'm going to tease him. No, that's really good. I don't have to bother. Anyway, as, as Richard was previewing, coming up, from bikes to trains to screwed over employees, a former Toys R Us worker is here for a special Swamp Watch you won't want to miss. And be sure to tune in at 10 p.m. Eastern here on the Fox News Channel for Life, Liberty, and Levin. Here's Mark with a preview. This week on Life, Liberty, and Levin, Mike Huckabee is my special guest, and he'll say things you've never heard him say before. We discuss faith, family, freedom, and the fundamentals of the Constitution. Don't miss it. For decades, retail giant Toys R Us dominated the American toy sales market. But as of last month, Toys R Us is no more, with all 735 stores closed and 33,000 employees out of work. As sad as the situation is for all the fans of the store, the reality the employees face is even worse. The Toys R Us bankruptcy is this week's Swamp Watch. <laughs> The 
Because of the crippling debt that forced Toys R Us out of business, employees were given nothing but a thank you, not seeing a dime of the $75 million they say they're entitled to as severance pay. That's because current bankruptcy rules define employee severance payments as unsecured debt only paid after secured debts like the bank loans that pay for lawyers and financial advisors. By the time the fat cats are paid for, there's nothing left for the employees. Those rules go back 40 years to the 1978 Bankruptcy Reform Act. Congress could change them if they wanted to. But of course they don't, because as Swamp Watch has shown time and again, Congress has a long track record of siding with big business against the American worker. To throw salt in the wound of this Toys R Us case, 17 of their executives, including CEO David Brandon, were handed out between 16 and $32 million in bonuses last year. Yes, bonuses. The executives justified this by saying the bonuses were necessary to make sure they performed at a high level during the bankruptcy. Absolutely sickening. And that's not all. Toys R Us attorneys and advisors are expected to be paid almost $350 million in fees. For example, bankruptcy lawyers Kirkland and Ellis admitted in court filings they were charging as much as $1,745 an hour that's 25% more than the average highest rate in 10 of the largest bankruptcies in 2017. Not to mention bankruptcy consultants Hillco Global and Tiger Capital Group, who actually got bonuses for closing stores quickly. And you can be sure New York-based Malfitano partners, hired for help in solicitating and evaluating proposals to liquidate inventory, will be cashing their paychecks as well. But store employees? They're left looking for new retail jobs with no severance pay as a cushion, hoping their next company won't also go bankrupt and screw them all over again. To all the elitists out there, this is why we have the populist revolution. This is why Donald Trump was elected. This is why when Bernie Sanders talks about a rigged economy, he's right. People across the country, including D.C. lawmakers, are taking aim at private equity firms Bain Capital, started by Mitt Romney, KKR and Vornado Realty Trust for their role in Toys R Us's downfall. And many are saying the Wall Street billionaires who killed the company with crippling debt are now laughing their way to the bank, sucking out $470 million in management and interest fees. Well, former Toys R Us workers are fighting back, and former store manager Madeline Garcia joins me now. Madeline, thank you so much uh, for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Just tell us about your experience. Uh, thank you, Steve, for having me. Um, I've worked for Toys R Us for 30 years. I started as a cashier and worked all my way all the way up to store manager in the Boynton Beach, Florida store. And to find out that Toys R Us was going out of business, closing was devastating for all of us. It's something that we did not expect. When they announced that they were going to close the stores at the beginning of the year, there was a communication mm -hmm. that went out that said they're going to close the first 182 stores and team members will be placed either at another nearby store or they will be given a severance package to help them through the transition. A month later, mm -hmm. they came back and said there is no severance pay for no team members because oh of the gosh. bankruptcy filing. So it's, it's actually worse than, than, than what I just laid out, because it's not just that they left you with nothing. They actually broke a promise that they would protect you through this, this, this Correct. tough time. Correct. Oh Toys R Us have always, for 70 years, have give, paid out severance pay when they closed down a store or they had eliminated a position. This time they came back and just said no because of the bankruptcy laws. However, the executive okay. bonus says... However, yeah, sorry, all the top executives received... I just received wanted to... Go ahead, Steve. Look, I can imagine how you feel. I don't want to you know, make the pain worse for you, actually. I just want to ask you, hopefully in a more positive and optimistic way, what can we do about it? What are you trying to achieve? What can we help with to try and do something about this? We want to see the changes made in the bankruptcy laws so that this doesn't happen again mm -hmm. in future for retail workers. We also want Bain Capital, KKR, and Bernardo Realty Trust to come to the table and pay the Toys R Us workers what we deserve. We worked hard for our for it. We built the company. They didn't do it. We did. So we deserve to get severance. It's the only fair and right thing to do. And just a final question. Is, there, is, there, is this an organized effort? Who, are you part of a group pushing for this? Yes. 
We're part of Rise Up Retail, which is a movement of workers fighting for voice and respect in the retail industry. Great. Well, I just wanted to say thank you again for coming and sharing your experience. I really, really appreciate it, and, and all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So, um, I mean, I don't know, that, that, what we just learned there, that it's not only they didn't pay up, they promised they would, and then they didn't. I mean, this is, like you were saying, this is... This is not, uh, sadly, Steve, this is, we've seen this movie play out before. Right. Over and over again, we've seen corporations and a Congress that is backed by corporations because yes. their lobbyists run through Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, and they do what they want. And just take, just, let's talk about the Trump tax, for example. Many of these companies benefit from this tax cut. Kimberly Clark is another one of these bad corporations. And after getting money from the tax cut, getting money from American taxpayers, they let off 5,000 people, right? And when you talk about the bankruptcy reform, which was also, it was renewed in 2005, mm -hmm. every time they open up the bankruptcy reform, every time they open up bankruptcy laws, it mm -hmm. always benefits bank and yes. bank regulators, and it never benefits the American people. So we've got to be mindful about what's happening in this country, and I think it's very important for everybody watching tonight to make sure they're calling the member of Congress and being very mindful of the bills that's passed and who is behind them yes. and what is being done and who is who's it for and who is it against. Usually, it's against working families. Right. So look, the interesting thing politically, Lisa, I think, is that President Trump unusually for a Republican. He talked all the time about being the party of the American worker. Still does. That means getting involved on the workers' side on issues like this, no? Well, you've also seen under President Trump hundreds of businesses passing savings from the tax reform law down to employees, and President Trump has highlighted those stories at events across the country. So you've also seen that. I actually think her biggest gripe and grievance should be against Toys R Us and their failure uh, to their failure to look at basically the changes in, um, you know, with internet retailers like Amazon and Walmart and their failure to change point. their business yep. model to keep up because it's basically Amazon and Walmart's ability to bring toys at a much cheaper uh, cost that has helped driven Toys R Us out of business. So they, their antiquated business model wasn't able to keep up in the changing yeah, economy. I, I get so that, honestly, I think the biggest your, grievance if you is with your mismanagement workers, on a, the business side of things. But if you promised your workers a severance package and you've given severances in the past, you're like, oh, we have a little loophole, so we're going to get yeah, out they're, of it. They're and they're paying paying I just want to say something. We don't yeah, have but they're paying off their shareholders. I want to say something. They're paying off their shareholders. I want to say something, which is that that point that Lisa made about the transition to a new company is so important. And that's why I'm so believe the fact that we actually had a really important announcement on that this week from the Trump administration, led by Ivanka Trump, a new initiative to train workers for the jobs of the future. Do you know how much coverage that got? We did, a, we did analysis. ABC News, zero. NBC News, zero. CBS News, zero. They're not interested, and yet that's the kind of thing that actually could help with a very good point you made about this big economic transition. I've gone on too long. Sorry about that. Coming up, is there a positive alternative to our economic relationship with China? There is actually, and after the break, we'll meet the author of a new book who knows all about it. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. If you've watched this show before, and if not, why haven't you? You've probably heard all about why I think China is the real enemy America needs to be wary of, not Russia. But is there an alternative to economic dependence on China? What about India? Joining me now from Singapore, the author of The Billionaire Raj, A Journey Through India's New Gilded Age, James Crabtree. I think we're going to say good morning to you, James. It's morning there, isn't it? Good morning, Steve. Yeah, it's about uh, 9.40 in the morning here in Singapore. Very good. So listen, um, you've, you've written all about India and how that country's changed so uh, remarkably in, in recent years. Um, I think that this argument about China often goes one way, which is, yeah, we'd like to kind of disentangle ourselves from China. It's not a great regime, et cetera, et cetera. But you're stuck because, we, we, you know, who else are you going to trade with? Who else are you going to invest with, et cetera? But India is a massive economic opportunity, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, India is a huge and growing economy. It's the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, you were just talking about Amazon and Walmart in your last segment. So Walmart just invested $16 billion to buy an Indian tech company. Amazon's investing $5 billion to try and become the largest e-commerce player in, in India. Uber, as well, is trying to, to win there. So you have a lot of American businesses looking to India as it starts to grow in the way that China used to. But it's a much bigger issue. Uh, China, as you have said on your show, is slipping backwards into a form of neo-Leninist or 
autocracy. Uh, India is the world's largest democracy. It's a broadly speaking market economy. It could be a great friend to America if America plays its cards right. So what do you describe in your book in terms of what's, what's happening with India's economic and development and in other ways? So India is growing very quickly, as I said, to the world's largest, uh, world's fastest growing economy. India, although it actually has some of the same problems that you face in the United States, so it has a deep and vibrant tech center, sector, it has a lot of big companies, but it also has a growing problem with inequality. Um, there were only two billionaires in India in the mid-1990s. There's now something like 120. Uh, that's more than any country apart from China and America. So while India is growing and becoming more economically important and attracting more investment, it's also struggling with some of the same problems uh, of inequality that you have in the United States. And do you think that India, what's the attitude of India to um, uh, investment and economic partnership? Would they, would they welcome it with open arms or are they more kind of wary of, for example, the US getting involved with them economically? Well, I think this is the big opportunity that if you look at it, particularly from Silicon Valley, where, where you live and uh, where you, we were talking, what you've been talking about, um, China has a completely closed ecosystem for foreign investment. So if you look at the American tech giants, they're not even allowed to open there. Uh, India is Facebook's largest market by users, Google, Twitter. Uh, they don't make a lot of money there because the country is quite small, but in terms of the number of people they have using their platforms, it's big. And so while China has a big head start, both in terms terms of the size of its economy and the vibrancy of its tech sector, uh, India has a much more open system uh, and one that's much more uh, willing to engage with outsiders, particularly from the United States. Mm -hmm. And so in the, in the medium term, that should give India an advantage. James, brilliant. Um, I have to leave it there for now, but I really want to talk about this a lot more. I think it's crucial in terms of the sort of geopolitics in, in the rest of this century, frankly. Your book is fascinating. Congrats on that. I hope everyone goes and buys it. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Coming up, Lisa and Richard are back with Final Thoughts. Don't go away. So, time for some wise words from our fantastic team here. Richard, over to you. Well, I actually think this India segment was interesting because I think if... Unlike of, the rest of the show. No, the whole <laughs> no, show yeah, was interesting, but the India segment was interesting, particularly, <laughs> particularly because... Yeah, I got it. Instead of, I think, a senseless trade war against China, I think we're better off yeah. using our, 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 in, our, in, our money uh, investing in India as a way to counterbalance China because of the amount of foreign direct investment they have in emerging markets all across the world. That's a great point. They're huge on that. I thought the immigration segment was very interesting among the other ones as well. <laughs> to, but, uh, just looking at the 180 that Democrats have done on the issue, and also one thing that never gets talked about is if you actually look at polling, the majority of Americans side with President Trump on a lot of these issues, whether it's sanctuary cities, whether it's border security, yeah. um, and even on the wall. So something that doesn't get talked about. It's true. You, I'll show you the polling, Richard. We can talk right. about well, it. We're going to keep, keep, we're gonna keep <laughs> talking about it. That is all we have time for tonight. You can learn more about the next revolution by following us at Next Rev FNC. Mark Levin is up next. I'm Steve Hilton. See you next Sunday when the next revolution will be televised.